Welcome to the Brainstorm episode 78. Big Ideas is out in the wild, Nick. It's out there. People can look at it. It is. Um, but let's, uh, I think today we're going to dive into humanoid robots, maybe keep it brief. Everyone should stay tuned because I think each analyst, director, team is going to be doing some deep dive videos. Um, so if you have questions out there, I would reach out. Everyone's active on Twitter, ask questions. Um, but I think humanoid robots is at, we had Tesla's earnings a couple of weeks ago where that was a, a big topic. There is a uh, figure AI. I think last week it was uh, CEO Brett mentioning that they are uh, no longer necessarily partnering with open AI. What do you make of that? I feel like that's very big news that's flown under the radar because I'll give you what I think it implies. It's yeah. that, and maybe it ties back into the discussions we've been having around open versus closed source and the progression we've seen in performance of open source models. And I'm wondering if that same type of performance gap, uh, the narrowing of that performance gap is happening within the realm of software running these humanoid robotics um, and so maybe it's that, you know, they're seeing such uh, gains in performance in the open source space. They don't feel the need to tie themselves to a single operator. But that means, you know, is there a commoditization of the brain, so to speak, of these humanoid robots? Yeah, but that's kind of where my mind went first was, OK, you've got open source. But I think there's a lot of things going on. You also have... OpenAI hiring for internal robotics, right? Figure wasn't the only place they made investments, right? I think 1X is another company they invested in. I think verticalization uh, is going to be important. And I also think it's important to look at, you know, what is OpenAI doing and where does that apply for the capability of a humanoid robot, right? So it's like, you've got the hardware as one level, you've got motion control of the robot as another level. Uh, and obviously this is broad strokes. And then at the top you have the cognition, right? So it's like if a, to do your job, you not only need to go through the motions, but you also need to, you know, think. Uh, and so those, it'll be interesting to see how those two layers interface. Um, and I think this gets into kind of just thinking about humanoid robots broadly, which is this separation of what is a job versus what is a task. Uh, and so it's like, you know, I think dishwashing, this, I, I put a slide in here. Um, maybe should I pull up the slides? Pull up the slides. Pull, pull up the slides. slides. Pull, pull up, up the, slides. the slides. All right. Decoupling physical labor from output. That one that's an important statement to uh, accept and understand. That is essentially the history of automation, right? It's like we would still be working agriculture if we didn't get leverage from some sort of automation. Uh, and that's the continued on trend. I'll scroll through these quickly because I'll go, I'll do another video diving in. Um, but I think a good, another big point here is it's like automation creates industries that people don't expect, right? So this before and after washing machines and time it takes to do laundry, it's not as though people were spending 15 hours a day and doing laundry every week, right? That is not what happened. It took that long. And as a result of that, they did laundry, you know, every six months. Uh, and so you create a whole different industry fashion, washing machine, service, repair. It's like all of these things evolve because you've changed the dynamics of what's possible. Um, this one, this one's big, the big number slide, right? 26 trillion global revenue opportunity. We could probably spend the whole time uh, talking about this, but I'm going to save that as well. I want to talk about this slide right here. 
Beautiful slide. So I think what often gets missed with humanoid robots or is missing from the conversation is one, there's the obvious statement, and this is the one that Elon has said, this is, you know, why everyone is excited. If you can replace a human with a robot, it doesn't matter how much the robot costs, right? It's $550,000 for a human working over the course of 10 years. And that's not including the cost of turnover, which is actually very high if you have to hire and find these workers. This is just, you know, one for one replacing them. Really, the interesting part is this bottom left-hand corner of this chart. And this is saying, as robots begin to be able to do certain tasks, what is it worth? Um, and this ties into this second slide here, which is jobs are bundles of tasks, right? We've got dishwashing machines. Those are amazing. There's still a professional dishwasher market, which is you know, close to double the dishwashing machine market. So we've got a great automation that cleans dishes. We're still hiring a lot of dishwashers. And what these professional dishwashers do, a lot of us at home still do, even though we've got something that's doing the specific task of washing dishes. But that's not the full job, right? It's like cleaning the food off of the plate is a task. There's also getting the stuff off the table into the dishwasher. And there's also getting stuff from the dishwasher to your cabinets. Um, and that's, you know, those things take up time. You know, professionally, food comes in, you got to move stuff, set up stuff. Uh, and those collection of tasks make up a job. And so being able to automate a human's task is interesting because unlike, I would say, autonomous driving, you can tackle a single task first and start to deploy it. And that opens up the opportunity. But we shouldn't confuse, going back to this chart, replacing a single task with being able to do 100% of what a human does. And so I think that is a lot of where the conversation gets lost is, you know, if you can do one task, you can have a huge opportunity from the robotic side, but it could not change much for the, the human. Does that make sense or am it I squares. I, I think to <clears throat> tie it back into the general software space and the progress where we've been seeing in the large language models, it is, you know, the shift from, what we have today to agentic capabilities, which is stringing together multiple actions to take you through a journey. Um, and I think it is interesting when you, I guess I like the comparison to the autonomous driving space because you can go at this task by task um, and provide value without having to do the entire job first. Right. And then, and that's where cost matters, right? If you can do the whole job, you can sell these things for half a million dollars and it's a worthwhile investment. But it's like Kiva robots. It's like, what can they do? Uh, Amazon warehouse. It's like they could literally go to a QR code on the ground and then go to another QR code on the ground. And that simple ability to move and carry stuff, like they were deployed, hundreds of thousands of them were deployed on that single task alone. But there's still a huge opportunity to what you're saying. And it's like, you need the cognitive side of it, which is very different and complementary to the mechanical side of it. Um, so then maybe just quickly here to step back and talk about where I think we are with humanoid robots. Um, some of it reminds me of the eVTOL, electric vertical takeoff and landing space where right now we're at the company creation phase and that's good. You need that, right? It's like Tesla got involved, that validated the space. And so now you've got tons of people raising money on this promise because it's clear that something could materialize. 
Um, but I think there's necessarily going to be a shakeout. Um, and that's, you know, this is kind of just the evolution of the way things work. I think it's capital intensive as well. So there's that similarity. Um, and it's both software and hardware, which makes it very difficult to successfully thrive and, uh, you know, train end to end to, you know, find which tasks you can commercialize with. Who, right. who are the, so you mentioned Tesla, we talked figure in the beginning, who are the other players to watch in this space? Sure. And the reason I spoke about those two is because those are the ones that we are invested in. So that's, you know, full, full disclosure. Full transparency. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, so other, other companies that are doing interesting things, um, you've got the Chinese players. So I believe Unitree and Fourier are probably ones that you see a lot of videos of. I think those are moving fast, but likely, you know, I, it seems like those might not be as commercial ready. I say this so that I get lots of comments on YouTube. Yes, post, post videos of them actually doing, doing things, not just for research labs. Um, you've got... Uh, Aptronics, another one in the U.S. Um, Agility is one that was, I feel like they kind of were actually a little bit earlier to the space. I, I haven't heard so much recently from them. Same thing with Boston Dynamics, right? They've been doing this for a long time, um, but pre kind of the AI wave of things. And I think those, you know, you need both of those um, held together. I think there is, what is it, Clone? maybe it's clone robotics is trying to do like a non-mechanical solution to hand dexterity, which is interesting. Um, but I do think right now it's very early, a lot of people trying things and uh, the combination of hardware, software, plus capital intensity and need to scale are going to make this a extremely tough environment for multiple companies to to thrive so last question for you on this space as an outsider looking in and having followed this from a distance and listening to you over the years if i had to rewind the clock and go back five six years ago and made a decision on who would be leading the humanoid robotic space maybe nine out of ten people including myself would have said oh boston dynamics and maybe you would have even said that given all of the flashy videos they were showing at the time. What happened there? What do you think, you know, led to this growth of new competitors and where did Boston Dynamic go wrong? Or maybe they haven't gone wrong. Where do they fit into this equation? Because I think most people, when they think of robotics, they think of those those videos of Boston Dynamics, but we haven't mentioned them once. I, I just mentioned them. I just mentioned them. Oh. Uh, <laughs> um, but... Where do, I don't think so to start off one, I think they're extremely talented, right? They have a lot of pedigree and smart people. The company changed, changed hands a few times. So that always hurts, you know, strategy and path. Um, but I, you know, the, the analogy here is kind of like, uh, Waymo and Google. And it's like, they were working on it pre the AI deep mind stuff. And then they kind of went back and, iterated with that. And I think it's, it's similar on the robotic side where Boston Dynamics was doing a lot of hard coded things and now AI has come along and it's, you know, going AI first is I think going to be important for strategy. Um, and also it's like, you know, if we went back five years and even Tesla said this now, you know, it was, we were like, okay, this is a hardware issue right? There's not the uh, fine actuation that was needed. Uh, and then even now, right, Tesla said, we're not buying anything off the shelf because it doesn't exist. We're making it ourselves. And now it's very much become a software problem. So it's like, that's the excitement and the, like the why now. Humanoid robots is software plus hardware, but the capability advancements uh, are going to be software defined and software is moving very quickly. 
And when you say software defined, let's a you know picture this out a few years. Maybe they become available to everyday consumers as household gadgets or assistants. How do you think they deploy first? Is it that they're they come custom built with a few tasks, like they can do your dishes, they can do your laundry, they can take out the trash, but beyond that, the capability is limited? Or do you think it will be like what we're accustomed to with ChatGBT and some of these LLMs where you can ask and it can kind of zero shot, learn on the fly how to do something with enough training? And yeah, how do you imagine this plays out? I think this is going manufacturing first. So, so not consumer. I, yeah, I think I think consumer not will so. consumer will happen down the line, right? We have it as half the long term opportunity, uh, but it seems like factories are a great spot. It's more controlled environment. It's on your own terms. Fewer risks of injury, right? Like once you send this into a house, you got you probably have way more liability. Um, and expose yourself to more unconstrained environment. So, and again, exactly what you said, it's, you know, simple task, lifting something up and putting it down is a huge opportunity. Being able to pick and place something out of a bin is like a holy grail in manufacturing and warehouses and all of that. So, you know, I think it starts with very straightforward tasks and then evolves into jobs, right? And it's like the yeah. classic example I give is if you could hire a humanoid robot or whatever shape robot you want that can potentially generalize to other tasks to go around and empty trash cans into the big trash can and then to take that trash can and empty it into the dumpster. It's like that's a great, probably very big business opportunity. Well, I think what is exciting is yeah, may release with predefined skills and tasks that it can accomplish. But because the you should be able to release over the air updates, right? They will have more capability the longer that they're trained on specific tasks. So I think I I guess that's why this is so much more exciting than just single purpose robots, you know, the the arm that can move something on a conveyor belt because you can continue to adapt it to its environment and and add on skill sets over time. Exactly. And that's why humanoid, right? Like that's why that form factor, that generalizable nature is you can humans learn, the robots will learn. Yeah, I like the way Brett phrases it. You're just backfitting it to the, how the world works today. Exactly. Yeah. So everyone stay tuned for other people going through their big ideas sections. I'll do a deeper dive on robotics and happy to answer questions on X. Thank you, everyone.